Assalamu alaikum. Dear learners, if you have watched the previous video, you must know that we are discussing force sensors, torque sensors and acceleration sensors. All these sensors are related with each other in one or another way. In this video, I am going to talk about different torque sensors that are available and what is their working principle and where they are being used. You must know from your physics course that what torque is. Torque is a turning effect which a force produces. It is the effect that tries to rotate something about its own axis. The most common equipment where you should have listened or used this term is a motor. For any motor, the amount of turning effect it can generate is called torque. Moreover, if you have ever driven a motorbike, the torque generated by your hand rotates the acceleration handle on the bike, hence the bike accelerates. Note one thing over here that mathematically movement and torque are equivalent to each other because movement is produced by a force acting on somebody at a particular distance from the pivot whereas torque is produced by the force acting on the periphery of the body such that it will try to rotate the body about its own axis. To clarify this point, let me draw two illustrations over here. In the first case, let's suppose there is a beam like this and it is pivoted at this point through some mechanism. Moreover, suppose that a force is acting over here that is trying to rotate this beam about this pivot point and the distance of the application of this force from the pivot point is R. In this case, the movement generated. Note that we are calling this thing movement. The movement will try to rotate this beam in counterclockwise direction and it will be given mathematically as F dot product with R. Now on the other side, suppose that we are seeing a cross-sectional view of some beam which is a circular cylindrical beam and the center point is the axis of this beam. You can suppose that the axis of the beam is coming out of the screen towards you. Now, if a force is acting on the periphery of this beam, it will try to rotate this beam in counterclockwise direction about this central axis. The distance of the application of force from the central axis is the radius of this beam, which is R. And now in this case, we will say that the torque being produced over here is equal to F dot R. So the need for measuring the torque arises from the fact that whenever torque is transmitted through shafts or gears, it needs to be measured so that we can establish how much torque we are providing and how much torque is being transmitted and how much torque is needed by something. I will discuss these three common methods that are used to measure torque. So let's start with it. The first method is measurement of reaction forces when something is rotated by a torque. In the schematic shown, you can see a power source, which is most probably a motor, that will rotate and torque will be transmitted to the cradle through a shaft. You can think of this arrangement as the fan whose fins are rotating because of the torque generated by the motor. Now, if the motor is rotating and there is no obstruction to the rotation of the cradle, the cradle will rotate with the rotating shaft of the motor. But if we have this kind of arm with the cradle and we place a simple force measuring instrument underneath this arm at a particular distance, then the force sensor will obstruct the rotation of the cradle. And the force which this arm is going to exert on the force sensor will be noted. Multiplying this force with the arm length will give you the amount of movement or in this case the amount of torque with which the cradle is rotating. Considering that there is no twist in the shaft, all the torque that is generated by the power source will be transmitted to the cradle and hence the torque will rotate the cradle but a force sensor will resist this rotation. This whole arrangement can be inverted as well as shown in this schematic. By simply multiplying F with the arm length will give you the torque generated by the power source. Note over here that this method can only be used to measure torque by fully loading the power source, that is by resisting its rotation. 
so that it cannot rotate. This condition is called stalling and the torque which is measured is called the stall torque. Over here I am going to discuss one of the most famous method for measuring torque. This arrangement is called prony brake and it has other forms as well. I am going to discuss the simplest one just to convey the working of a prony brake. Over here a rotating drum is shown around which a rope is wound and the rope on one side is attached with a fixed spring whereas on the other side a weight is applied. The net force of friction acting on the rotating drum is equal to the difference between the weight and the force spring. Suppose that the drum is rotating in the clockwise direction and because of the friction between the rope and the drum over here and in all around the periphery, the drum will try to lift the weight upwards. On the other side, the spring is also lifting the rope upwards, hence complementing the rotation of the drum. In this case, the load is resisting the rotation, whereas the spring and the drum is trying to rotate on the other side. Hence, the effective force that is acting on the drum will be equal to the difference between the weight and the spring force. This force will be acting ideally at the center of the rope. Therefore, the distance of this force from the center of the shaft would be equal to the radius of the rope plus the radius of the shaft. Multiplying the effective force with the effective radius will give us the torque with which the rope is trying to resist the rotation of the shaft. Note one thing over here that this analysis will stand only when the shaft is stalled, that is, it has come to a complete rest. If the shaft is rotating, it means the effective force generated by the weight attached over here is not enough to stop the rotation, and hence more weight is added until the rotation of the shaft stops, and at this point, the torque calculated by the effective force and the effective radius will be equal to the torque with which the shaft was rotating. Another very famous arrangement of prony brake is shown over here. This prony brake has similar working principle to what I have just explained. But this prony brake can be easily used especially with engines where you want to stop the rotation of the engine shaft. If you press this pedal, more friction will be applied on the rotating shaft and hence its speed will reduce and can be stopped. Mostly tractors even nowadays are using these kind of brakes. The third method which I am going to discuss will measure the shear strain produced in the rotating shaft because of the transmission of torque. To understand how shear strain is produced in a rotating shaft, suppose the most extreme case where you have a certain metallic pipe in your hands. Use one hand to hold the pipe from one end and the other hand to hold the pipe from the other side. Now using one hand, try to rotate this pipe in one direction and using the other hand try to resist that motion. What is going to happen? You are going to produce a twist in this pipe and if this twist is more than this pipe can bear, this pipe is going to break from the center. And why is that? Because shear strain is acting over here that is trying to tear this pipe apart. The shear strain that this pipe was experiencing is obviously directly proportional to the applied torque. The more torque you are going to apply on the pipe, the more it is going to twist from the center. The last method which I am going to discuss will try to measure this twist to figure out the torque being supplied or provided through the shaft. One commonly used method to measure this shear strain is the placement of strain gauges at precise locations. The obvious advantage over here is that this kind of torque measurement will not load the system and hence you can measure torques other than stall torques as well. As far as bonding of strain gauges on the shaft is concerned, the strain gauges has to be positioned and oriented very carefully which make these kind of sensors quite expensive. Although these kind of arrangements can be used to measure torques less than stall torque, but the maximum twist will be shown by the shaft at the stall torque and hence it would be easier for the bonded strain gauges to measure that twist. However, if you are trying to measure torques lesser than stall torques, 
it means that the shaft is rotating and if the shaft is rotating then you have to implement some kind of slip ring mechanism that will make sure that power is continuously supplied to the strain gauges this will obviously further add the price another way to measure this twist angle is to use optical sensors in the arrangement shown over here the encoder discs which are attached on the shaft will produce same pattern if there is no twist present between the two discs however if there is a certain twist present then one disc will produce a slightly different or you can say a lagging output as compared to the other one the amount of lag will represent the amount of twist and this twist can represent the amount of torque any other kind of angular position sensors can be used over here as well for example in state of the art robots two encoders are commonly used to measure the twist generated in any robotic link and hence torque is figured out I haven't talked about or discussed that what encoders are for that you have to wait until my video on rotational displacement sensors comes out in that video I will discuss that what encoders are and how they are used to measure angular displacement over here some of the state of the art torque sensors are shown these kind of sensors are inserted between the shaft at precise location so that the twist produced by the torque in the shaft is effectively produced in the shaft of this sensor inside these sensors optical arrangements or encoders are attached that can measure that twist on the other hand this kind of flange type torque sensor is also inserted in the rotating shaft and because of the torque the two flanges will twist and this twist is measured by the strain gauges which are installed inside this shaft these torque sensors utilize the working principle of a load cell to figure out the torque. Suppose that if the inner ring is attached with a rotating shaft and the outer ring is attached with a load or you may want to hold the outer ring in your hand firmly so that when the shaft rotates, sensor will not rotate with it. Now if this is the case, then the internal structure of this sensor is going to deform and this will be because the shaft attached in the inner ring is trying to rotate this structure whereas you are holding it and resisting this rotation or whatever load you have applied at the outer ring is resisting the rotation the deformation produced in the structure will be noted by carefully placed strain gauges and hence the deformation can be related to the amount of torque being applied these kind of torque sensors are being used in state of the art collaborative robots to measure torques being generated by each robotic joint. This was everything about torque sensors and I hope that you have understood how torque measurement is carried out in practical situations. Thank you and take care.